We live in a constantly changing world where the speed of information is changing how we think and act and connect with one another. When people in a society lose faith in their institutions, in God and in each other, the nation collapses. We need help rebuilding trust and tying it all together. Welcome to All That To Say, a podcast exploring the interrelatedness of all things in long-form conversation. Gospel music icon Sandy Patty joins Jim Lyon to share on fame, the future of the music industry, and the evangelical church. All that to say, Jim Lyon here, and alongside Ryan Woolsey. Ryan is our tech guy. He's the guy who's going to feed images and things. He's just our backup. (laughs) Hey, Ryan, so good to have you with us. Hey, good to be here from um, cloudy Atlanta. Ah, uh, cloudy Atlanta. But, you know, the sun's always shining where Ryan Woolsey walks. That's my game. <laughs> and with us, we're so glad to have Sandy. Patty, Sandy, we live in a tumultuous world, and I, I just have to, to tell you, uh, you have been on a big stage in your lifetime. Uh, you have stood in front of amazing crowds. And, you know, just last night, just last night, <laughs> I was in my basement, in the bunker of my house in this tumultuous world, and I pulled up YouTube, and I don't know what prompted me to it, except maybe I knew I was going to talk to you today, but I just thought, Sandy Patty, when did I hear Sandy Patty? What? I, was, I was recalling, I, I'm not suggesting that you're old like me, but I'm so old, mm. that in 1986, I remember being at my parents' house in Seattle, watching an NBC television special called Christmas in Washington, and there you were. You were standing out front... You had an opening song with the other stars in the gala. (laughs) And then the camera pans, and there's Ronald Reagan, then president, with his wife, Nancy, first lady, and a whole constellation of all the power players in Washington. They're all there. The Christmas trees are on. I mean, it was just spectacular. Oh, and not to mention, Sandy Patty sang like heaven sent. (laughs) All right. And as I was watching it, one, I was so amazed, Sandy, at your ability to command the stage. I mean, you stood out there. And as best I can tell, you were about 30 years old, mm-hmm. and you, you, you owned the room. Yeah. And then I thought about the room, and all those people, mm. Republicans and Democrats, left and right, right, the establishment of our country, all gathered in a Christmas moment where you were singing about your, your faith, really. I mean, it, it wasn't just mm-hmm. a show. You were, right. you were articulating words about your allegiance to and your, your worship of Jesus, Christmas, mm-hmm. his celebration of his birth. And all the people, and actually the country, gathered around in that moment. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, it's hard to imagine that even today. Oh. I mean, do you ever think about that? Uh, you know, truly. Um, Thanks for having me on because I, one of my favorite things is to just talk with Jim Lane. Like <laughs> oh. I just, I, I love to talk with you. I love to listen to you. I love, I just, I just love it. Well, uh, I, so let me just I, say, I'm, I've got a list of people. Could you write them some notes for me? Because, yes, I will. <laughs> yes. Right. Sorry. Go ahead. Go on. <laughs> but, I, but I really do because you give great context and I love context. Um, so anyway, it's just one of the myri- the one of the myriad things. Did I use that correctly? Yeah, I'm I'm with you. Myriad. Not myriad of things. Myriad things. A whole, I don't know how to say a whole lot of things. A whole lot. <laughs> yeah. A whole lot of stuff. Okay. So yeah, that um that was after 1986 that I had done the Statue of Liberty, uh, the rededication, and, and I had sung the Star Spangled Banner. Which I thought I would never have to record it ever again or sing it ever again. Um, but well, who knew that the Star Spangled Banner was a re- was a career breaking song? Who well, knew? I mean, well, yeah, I'm sure that <laughs> Francis Scott Key did not imagine that it would open up doors of talent. But uh, let's go back to that for people yeah, who might not understand yeah. that in 1986 the mm-hmm. Statue of Liberty had been restored. It Correct. was actually a gift from France to the United mm-hmm. States for the centennial of the American Republic. 1876, but it, it wasn't actually set up and running uh, for a few years in the 19th century. It kind of got run down, so it was all in the scaffolding and people mm-hmm. restored it. And so in 1986, 
Independence Day, Fourth of July, big national celebration. Francois Mitterrand, the president of France, comes over, meets President Reagan in the harbor. The whole country is glued to the fireworks show as the Statue of Liberty kind of is re not reinstalled, but rededicated. Yeah, rededicated. Yeah. And in the background is this like amazing rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, the national anthem, with soaring, I mean, soaring emotive power. Everybody's heard it. We've sung it, most of us in school at some point, if you grow up in the States, uh, but never had it been heard or impactful, I think, like that minute. And, and that was Sandy Patty. And you're, well, tell, um, you're telling me it was kind I, of like an open door for your uh, career. Yeah, it was crazy. So earlier that year, several Christian artists got together and we're going to do a project to just help raise money for the Ellis Island Foundation. And so I was asked to do the Star Spangled Banner, and David Clydesdale said, you know what, what if there was a brand new verse that was written? Because there's, there's several verses that exist already for the Statue of Liberty, but what if there was a brand new verse that would sort of bring those lyrics into present time? So Claire Cloninger, who's a wonderful lyricist in the Christian community world, she wrote that, and still we can see as the years have gone by, um, she wrote that whole second verse that I sang. Mm -hmm. And so then David Clydesdell asked me, okay, how high do you want to go on the end of the <laughs> How song? high can you go? And I said, David, do not write me above a B flat. That's, that's, that's high enough. So he, that was the day he was handwriting all of his scores because um, there was no you know, computer generated, sure. all of that. So I come to the studio in a couple of days and I immediately flip my music to the end. And I see that the last note is significantly higher than a B flat. It was a D flat. And I said, David, what on earth? He said, oh, I'm so sorry, but my pen slipped. <laughs> uh, and he said, but don't worry, you're never going to have to sing this song again. So that was, ABC owned the record company at the time. So unbeknownst to me, when the 4th of July happened, Peter Jennings was recapping the entire weekend, which ABC was ABC awesome. News anchor, legendary. Yeah, yeah. He, um, he said, you know, we're going to do a video montage, and um, there's a beautiful song by this little housewife from Indiana. So he played that version of the Star Spangled Banner while they did a video montage. When they came back, so I was home. Like, <laughs> I wasn't even there. <laughs> I often refer to it as the best gig I ever had, <laughs> as I love because to be home. the whole nation was glued <laughs> to this, and you're at home. <laughs> and I'm home. And you know how you sort of hear something, but when it's out of context, mm -hmm. you can't place it right away? Yeah. And so it was Anna, who was just, you know, just your daughter. two at the time, my oldest daughter. Uh, she said, Mommy, that's you singing. And I'm like, well, it is. So then my mother calls. <laughs> She wants to make sure I'm watching and then call waiting comes on, you know, because yeah. you have to like. Yeah. Push yeah. It. And so the phone started ringing and um, the next day ABC came out and did an interview with me and I got an invitation to go to the Tonight Show and just crazy things. So all of that sort of steamrolled into me being invited to uh, Christmas in Washington. Same year. year. Same year. Yeah, Same year. Right, right. And um, I, Mac Davis, who passed away in um, just last year, um, the day that he passed away, I just so vividly remember he was one of the guests mm -hmm. on Christmas in Washington. And how would you describe Mac Davis? Because some people who are listening today might not know that name. Well, I mean, he was he, a vocalist. He was a musician. Kind of, kind of from the country world. Just a good old guy, very kind, very down to earth, very approachable. And he did the kindest thing for me. Um, so at the, at the end of Christmas in Washington, everybody was to come up on the stage, um, all the artists with President Reagan and Mrs. Reagan. And so I didn't, you know, I was a newbie on the scene. I kind of just took my place, you know, away from President the center, Reagan. yeah. And Mac Davis said, honey, you need to come over here and stand by the president. He said, I've gotten my chance. It's your turn now. 
Is wow. that the sweetest uh, thing? Yeah, I mean, it was, well, he was reading a moment, though, Sandy. Yes, because, he was. Because in that, in that Christmas in Washington production, and Christmas in Washington was a national icon for 33 years. For 33 yeah. years, there was this generated musician, uh, musical extravaganza for Christmas that brought mm -hmm. together all of the power mm -hmm. players in D.C., to lead the nation in celebration of Christmas. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. And the president, whoever the president was, was always in the front row. Correct. And, and this year, there you are. And Mac Davis, I think, understood that in all of the gala, I think they had the Naval Glee Club. And I mean, yes. there was a Shiloh Baptist choir and there's the yeah. operatic oh. stars and I mean, all kinds yeah. of stuff. He knew, because I'm telling you, Sandy, even just watching it last night on YouTube, you were the star. I don't mean to say that mm. in any flip way, but the whole thing rose and crescendoed on your presence there. So I'm just saying, oh. that Mac Davis, nice guy, also a very smart guy, recognizing <laughs> that on this night, you mm -hmm. need to be center stage because with the president, you are the draw. And it was that, Sandy, it was well, fantastic. He, it was very gracious, and you know this, you know that a lot of people would not do that. That's and right. he, he, he seized that moment. So then afterwards, after we sang and we got off the air, the president and and um, the first lady were just thanking everybody. And she leaned in to hug me, uh, Mrs. Reagan. And she had this beautifully red beaded um, jacket on. And I didn't know, like I was so new, I just didn't know how to do my makeup or my hair. And I just stuck yes. on nails really <laughs> quick, you know, right before. And so I hugged her and I came back from hugging her and my pinky nail was missing and it had gotten stuck. <laughs> it's not in her dress. <laughs> but it was red, so I don't know if she ever found it. <laughs> she had a souvenir that oh she made out <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh, no, anyway. That's my two sweet stories well, about that. But you know, you bring up a really interesting point because, and you you can tell me when this was, but wasn't there a time during World War II that the Germans and the Americans had a ceasefire on Christmas Eve? Yeah, well, actually, it's World War I. Okay. And it tell, was the because that that's what we need right now, don't you think? We yeah. just need a moment to breathe. Will you tell that story? <laughs> well, please, just off I, the off the cuff, honestly, uh, I do I do know the story. That, we're talking to Jim Lyon. Well, we know the story. I, I you know what I know a lot of things that don't matter. <laughs> don't <laughs> ask me to five fix. On the, are you a five on the enneagram? I'm a I'm a three because I don't you really are. I don't really care if it's you know I, I just care about how it looks. <laughs> anyway. Wow. Oh, yeah, that, you, that's, okay. That's a three. I'm just, that's I'm a, a six. That's a downside three. Hey, I'm four sixes. I know, because uh, we predicted the world was going to end last well, year. We I, were I, already prepared. I don't really care, but you look really good. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so World but War One. In World War I, the Germans and the British were in trench warfare in Europe. And this mm -hmm. is where, you know, the opposing armies were actually kind of in a stalemate. They just... There was a trench between them, and they, you know, yeah. they'd lob their guns across the way, and it just went on and on and on. It was a horrific experience. But on one Christmas Eve, somebody, and uh, you know, there, there's disputes about who started what, but somebody started singing "Silent Night," likely on the German side because it's a German song. Yeah, but it was Christmas Eve, and the, somebody started singing it. And in the quiet, in the still of the night, when they were not bombarding each other the sound of it drifted across the trenches wow. and the British began to sing back in English. And so then we have this moment where the war is essentially stopped for the singing of Silent Night. And to your point, yeah, doesn't uh, our world, couldn't it benefit from, can we just all just stop and yeah, can we just have a silent stop night? And take a breath and... And maybe sing, that, that's sing something we have in common. Some, yeah, what, exactly. They found common ground in a shared experience of Christmas. Yeah, or anything. I'll take <laughs> well, anything. That's right. Let's move uh, on know, to Valentine's take, Day. We can make this work. Yeah, I, but, um, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot in uh, this year. We have lost the art. I don't, I don't necessarily, although I'm changing my p position on this a little bit, I don't know if that we really want to um, not listen, but we have lost the art of, of um, 
offering the dignity of disagreement. Mm-hmm. And um, it's either it's my way or the highway to where even sometimes at around a dinner table with our own kids, we avoid subjects because it's just become hard to articulate and knowing that they're, you know, it's almost like everybody knows we're not going to hear you no matter what you say. And I want to be, I want to be willing to listen. And I think me being a six on the Enneagram, I do this anyway, but to just hear an opposing opinion that doesn't mean just because someone says it, I either have to buy all in right. or buy all out. It can be both and. And I think if we can somehow figure out how to offer the dignity of disagreement again would so, be a really helpful thing. That's a really great phrase, dignity of mm. disagreement. Because and, it, 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 it is. It's, well, it's you, a respectful. I respect it, exactly, the fact exactly. that I may not know everything. Yeah, And I, I know what I know, but you might yeah. know something different, and I may not understand it yet, but I can give you the dignity of having a different view. Don't yeah. you think also, I mean, we live in a time of great defensiveness. I mean, this is another way of yes. kind of describing it. It's hard to have yeah. a conversation because it seems like everyone has to prove something. I have to prove yeah. that my position, my idea, my calculation is right. And so in the conversation, it's not really a conversation. It's about armed conflict with words and thoughts where I'm yes. getting ready to prove and defend myself instead Correct. of instead of just okay I, I, I've I've kind of come to think that people who are secure you know if you're really secure mm-hmm. with what you think I don't have to mm-hmm. prove anything to you and right. I can accept that you may have a different role on that and I don't have to prove it that's not to say I don't want to share with you what I think or why I think it but again right. it's giving you the dignity to have a different outcome. And yeah. that's the world we um, live in. Well, and, and I love this, the idea of the long-form interview that you all are doing here because it just, you know, so, so often when you're doing a podcast or a radio interview, it's like, okay, what is it they were really wanting me to say? And I, you know, put it down into a soundbite. Or with, yep. with newspapers, um, you can talk a little bit more, but if it's TV, if they just want that soundbite. And so I love that we can have this long form um, conversation for well, sure. I'm so glad you're in for that, uh, Sandy, because uh, yeah, I want to just unpack some things with you and, and kind of back to where we started this conversation. You have lived through an epic. Again, not that you are aged, it's just that as a very young woman, you actually. Am I the- <laughs> no, yeah. Hey, hey, listen, compared to me, you are still in the kid zone. Uh, Let's just say I qualify for phase two of the vaccine. Let's just <laughs> well, say that. All right. Well, <laughs> I, they called me up for the vaccine when it was first released. <laughs> <So, laughs> all right. But what I'm saying is, at a young age, you found success mm-hmm. professionally. Uh, there's a whole other story about Sandy's journey through life, but, but on the professional side of the ledger. You found success early on, first as a gospel artist, then that Statue of Liberty moment, which catapulted you into the whole national consciousness. And, and from there, standing to next to President Reagan at, a, at you know, an iconic moment in the nation, na- national life at Christmas and so on. And, and from that early start, you lived through decades of, of what shall we say, center stage life, and and also became kind of an iconic figure in evangelical American consciousness. Uh, Sandy Patty singing, We Shall Behold Him, or the Star Spangled Banner, or, I mean, there's so many uh, signatures that you contributed to the community of faith that was also recognized and, and respected beyond that community of faith, but you you watched all that. And how... You know, in 1986, the evangelical community in this country was kind of in its ascendancy. It was a a crescendo of influence and status that it might not have known in the 1950s or earlier on. And here we are, decades on, and and just as we've been talking about, it seems like we're in in an age, in a moment, where it's hard to reclaim some of the, the conversation or the presence or the witness or the 
the influence. Uh, what would you say? Or I mean, have you have you watched that? Maybe I, I, I don't want to lead the witness, so to speak. But have you observed no, no. also how dramatically the the stage has shifted, and we're far um, removed from those days? Can I? I'm going to answer that with two different streams. Okay. One, I'm going to answer through the stream of music. Um, I, I love Christian music. And why I love it has zero to do with the musical style. The mu- music, and, and I do talk about this a lot because I don't want people to mix it up. Music is personal taste. Let's just be honest. It is a, it it does evoke an emotional response from someone, but it's personal taste. What makes Christian music is the same thing that Jesus did as he sought to relate to whomever he was speaking. And that is the lyric content. And so, you know, in my 40 now plus years of being part of Christian music and now being on the church end of Christian music, um, I have loved seeing the personal taste spectrum grow. Because whenever you have something that really connects with people, but you have the same message, you really have a wonderful opportunity to plant life-changing thoughts, lyrics, ideas into people's hearts. Music helps words go in. I think that's why sometimes, not sometimes, that's why I think negative lyrics are so dangerous because they will sink in. They they walk through the doorway, the music opens. Yeah, exactly. And and so I am as big a fan of Bill Gaither now more than I have ever been. But I'm also a huge fan of Lecrae. Because mm-hmm. Lecrae is, he is on the front lines. He is talking about all the things he's messed up in his life and how God has come, you know, yes. there, and there's a gamut in between. And for me, it is about the message of Jesus. And if there's any music that can help people find and follow Jesus, I am all for. So I love that music has been able to grow and breathe and, and morph while keeping the integrity of the original intent. Would you know, when St. Saint, when Saint Francis of Assisi said, we need people to sing songs that are scripture because that will help them remember scripture. To me, that's where I still try to come from today. I mean, would you say that music, when you say music, you're talking about the melody, the tempo, yeah. the rhythm, the chords. Correct. That, that that's really like a language. Yeah. And, and different people respond or, or facile or are fluent in different languages. Yeah. But if I say, I love you in French or in Chinese or in English, it yeah. has the same impact, but it's useless if I that's speak ex- it in a language you don't understand. That's exactly right. And that's what right. I'm hearing you say. That so is exactly right. You're a fan right. and you believe that the genre of Christian yeah. music in 1980s and uh-huh. in these 2020s still yeah. has enormous value. Yeah, I do. And I'll tell you why. Also, I don't think Christian music will ever be as big as people hope it will be. Because Christian music, unlike, and when I say Christian music, with the lyric content, mm-hmm. unlike other forms of music, demands a response from the listener. Mm-hmm. And not everybody is ready to make that kind of response. Or even wants wife. to be exposed to the dare. Exactly. So, but when they're ready, it's there. And so I'm just really genuinely proud of so many of my Christian artists, people. And I think the other piece on the Christian music side is there is a a real freedom into talking and singing about real life stuff that I don't know existed maybe 40 years ago. It was all very you know, quiet and private. Um, and Idealized, I think he, maybe. Yeah, or just it's like, well, if I say this, then they're not going to like me. And I think people are, they welcome it being real life. Mm-hmm. So I am, I very much love that. There's a, an authenticity. Very, very much. And, and people can relate to that authenticity. There's Don popping into the podcast there. Hey. 
<laughs> There's Don Peslas, that's Sandy's husband, and uh, you are you're we in a, share an office. You you share an office in a great community of faith, a church in mm-hmm. Oklahoma City, where you call home. Yeah, and uh, both of you uh, are integral to that church's life. Yeah. Now, let me answer your question now with the other stream. Okay. And I want to, in answering it, I want to ask you a question. I have come to not refer to myself as evangelical because I do not like what people perceive as evangelical. And has that term changed over the last 40 or 50 years, I would refer to myself very clearly as a follower of Jesus. I think there's so much heaped on now the word evangelical I, that I don't want to be a part of. So I, I guess I'm going to toss that back to you. Well, um, I, I'm with you on that, uh, Sandy, in the sense that the word evangelical has accumulated a lot of baggage. And so I think there has been a, a, a cultural evolution in the way in which it's branded and what it represents to people. And I think that the vocabulary of following Jesus, you know, evangelical is not a biblical term per se. There is an evangelion in the scripture, you know, it's a kind of Greek a thing about sharing your faith and, and the truth and so on. And, and the term developed in in modern times to describe a, a part of the body of Christ that was fired up about the uh, sharing of the gospel and within a certain orthodox theology that was understood in Protestant concepts. Uh, today, though, that evangelical, because of the way in which it's intersected with the public square, is often a view differently than it was when you and I were younger. And so yeah. I'm with you on that. And all that to say, all that to say, evangelical. <laughs> it's, it's a great line. Uh, <laughs> the word evangelical, which is not a direct, it's not a direct line to describe the people of God from the scripture. A follower okay. of Jesus is a direct line from the scripture. Yes, okay. Come, that's what Jesus said. Follow me. I mean, that's that's yes. the call, isn't it? That's the dare. Yes, that's the absolutely. the ask. So if I say I am a follower of Jesus, what I'm doing is I am actually defining myself. By Jesus. Correct. What what I'm committing to, if I tell you I'm a follower of Jesus, then you're going to hold me accountable to the Jesus standard. Yeah. If I tell you I'm an evangelical, well, that could mean A to Z based on your perspective and so on. So I think you're correct. Yeah. And actually, there's quite a live debate right now uh, within Christian communities in this country about the use of the term evangelical, even from mm. the National Association of Evangelicals. Mm. wrestling with, is that a brand that really represents who we are in the public square today? And some people wonder, and some are defending that. Uh, There are churches that are called evangelical churches. I mean, that's actually in their name, Mm -hmm. but what does that mean? Right. But it's a complicated way. So where does that come from? Where does what? Like if, if people name their church evangelical, whatever, what would be the purest... Um, motive that that began? Well, I, I mean, I think it, again, evolutionary, it's not like a group of people sat down one day and said, oh, here's our brand. It, mm-hmm. it became, it grew in the language as a part of a definition within the larger body of Christ about a stream of thought, I think. Okay. Evangelicals, you know, historically in this country would see themselves as, as people who are a leech to the scripture and a conservative reading of scripture and a commitment to uh, evangelism, which is the sharing of their faith and yes. the propagation of the gospel and so on, and within a construct of a church, people who who were committed to walking in a New Testament way, so to speak, and that was defined yeah. variously. But that was to be differentiated from somebody who might have, who would say, Jesus is Lord, but maybe committed to liturgies or other forms of church structure or different kinds yeah. of of. Uh, a, understandings of the gospel import, faith and works and things like that. But, you know, if you go to Europe, you'll find that uh, there's, for instance, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Germany, which is a very big deal, the state church of Germany, the German government recognizes the Roman Catholic Church and the Evangelical Lutheran Church as, okay. as state churches. So when you live in Germany, you pay taxes and you support those. You can opt oh, out. Wow. You can opt out. But if you don't opt uh-huh. out, you're helping to keep that going. But the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Germany would not be evangelical in the way we imagine it yeah. in this state. Although we have the yeah. 
ESA, ELCA, that's the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, but it would mm-hmm. not be considered evangelical the way Southern Baptists think they're evangelical. I'm just saying it, yeah. it's become gotcha. a kind of a stew of yeah. varying points of view. And today, in today's political world, mm-hmm. it has also become a brand. Yeah, yes. And so, you know, you and I both know that in the press, there's been a lot of like broad brushing of people right. like you and me. Well, if you're evangelical, then you support Donald Trump. I'm not here to debate yeah. that. I'm just saying I'm not right. sure that that's true for all people in the churches Correct. I go to. And so yes. that's back to my question. You know, back in in 1986, when you're singing at the Statue of Liberty, or actually in your home, <laughs> <laughs> I know. watching it, in watching my it. I mean, you know, <laughs> there was a more congruent or a, a common understanding of what that meant. And mm-hmm. today, it's become almost a cudgel in some places. Yeah, and and I think that reflects a little bit of the just. The change in our society, the evolution of our society and our witness, which is what I was just throwing back to you because yep. I'm watching it as a guy on the curb. You lived it as a person on a stage. Well, um, so I feel like in my, this has been my view. And I, I wanted to go back to something you said, but when you feel confident of who you are, it's much easier because I love, I so love when Jesus was washing his disciples' feet. And the scripture says he knew where he came from and he knew where he was going. (laughs) Absolutely. Therefore, he could serve. I mean, that's my words. Mm but, um, But I think that's so important to know where you come from. I am from God. To know where I'm going, I am with God and he is with me then it is easier. So I just, I want to follow up yeah, to expand on that. Because with that I, I, think. I really, I think knowing who we are in Christ is, is critical. Um, and I forgot what I was going to say. Well, well uh, let me just, before we, I, I do want to dive into your lyric content, you know, yes. because you, you've, you've established that music. Oh, has, oh, oh, I know what I was going to say. I'm sorry. I didn't no, mean go. to interrupt right, you, but you we're on the go. long form. Yeah, for the long form, you go. <laughs> um, so my view when I have, I've been very privileged to be able to work with non-Christian, non-church events throughout my career. And if I'm going to show up in an orchestra and work with these musicians who have worked years understanding, learning music, there's a certain protocol you follow. Um, you know, it's, it's different than doing your own concerts. I've tried to really educate myself on what are those protocols? How can I show them that they matter to me? And for me, as a follower of Jesus, that has been my lens. How can I connect with you to show you that you matter to me? And one of the things, for instance, that I've really tried to do is whenever I do a rehearsal with an orchestra, I always do the rehearsal facing them rather than with my back to them, you know, because they're going to get plenty of that. And I think at first it really kind of unnerved a lot of orchestras. Because they're not used to that. They're not. And, and I came prepared. I knew my music. I mean, those kinds of things matter to them. So that's how I can show up in a situation and love. And that's speaking their language in a sense. Um, it's funny to me because the percussion guys were always the first ones to like give me eye contact back. <laughs> you know, they're like, yeah. And then the, you know, and then the brass very often, but not as often as much the violas. They just still kind of are a little, you know, but then afterwards, and I always try to thank them and, and, and tell them how much I appreciate their musicianship because it's true. They're just, they've dedicated their lives to make beautiful music. And so for me, that, that goes right alongside, they will know you are my followers by how you love one another. And that loving one another looks different in different settings. But um, so that, that's just one way that in my career that I've tried to love. Well, and I, as you're using the word love there, the only, thing I, the only thing, the next thing that comes to my mind is respect. What I heard you say mm-hmm. is, I, mm-hmm. I'm going to demonstrate my respect for them by honoring mm-hmm. the discipline of their craft. It would be mm-hmm. so easy for someone in your shoes to simply say, hey, 
I got this. I don't need to accommodate myself to what mm-hmm. you have been trained to do. And I, I've heard you say before, maybe I've uh, also seen it written in some of your books you've written, that you know, if you really want to, if you really see music as a calling, you better learn music. Don't learn just imagine it. because I can naturally do this that I don't have to do the work. That's exactly actually right. Actually mastering it. Because it is a discipline it, of knowledge. It is a discipline. And it is so fantastic to see how all of it comes together. And it's like, oh, I just say to God so often, dude, because sometimes I do call him dude. <laughs> music is really one of your best creations. Like, seriously. I don't, it's just, and the more I understand it, the more fantastic it is to me. Um and I'm just one of those music theory nerds, and I love it. And Jonathan and I, my son Jonathan, he and I will get to talking about music theory, and it's just like heaven. Um, but but truly, you wouldn't want someone operating on you who said, yeah, you know what? I operated on my cat when he was younger. I could do this. <laughs> oh, no, you need some Sorry, more education right. than that. Well, and, and I just feel like it's important. Well, a person gets into an orchestra. You You have performed with some of the greatest orchestras in the world. Uh, from the Prague Symphony to the London Symphony to the New York uh, Philharmonic to, you know, even in Indianapolis here, which is a, a symphony of some yes. renown. I mean, those people don't get to those chairs by sloughing no. off. And you, oh. you can't come in as a no. vocalist and say, I sloughed off. Absolutely I know, I get that. not. I, mean, I appreciate that. Yeah, and that's, absolutely and not. Sandy, I think you, you have a reputation for excellence. I mean, I know some people who have worked in studios where you have recorded, and they have said to me, well, you know, when, when she walks in, she knows exactly what's up <laughs> and what, what she wants and also what the musicians need. I mean, in other words, I've yeah. always heard people refer to working with you in a studio setting as something that was uh, demanding in the most healthy way because, because it was not mm-hmm. just off the cuff. It's not just unprepared. No, this woman comes to work mm-hmm. ready and prepared and and. Your career and demonstrates that, it, that. And that it is a village. And I, when I traveled with Bill and Gloria Gaither, which was such an incredible season of my life, but Bill would always, um, he would always say two things. One was, when the night wins, everybody wins. So, you know, it, it isn't about this one person or it isn't about this one song. It's about how the audience feels at the end of the night. And when the night wins, everybody wins. So By night, you mean when the performance. The concert, concert, like the concert, when the concert wins or the show wins or, you know, whatever. And the other thing that someday I'm going to write a little tiny, a little book about all the things I learned from Bill Gaither because (laughs) they are just gems. But when I was traveling with him, he and Gloria had just come from doing churches to arenas because there were that many people who wanted to come and be part of their evening. And he got, you know, a lot of flack from that. And Because he, and he I, just to clarify, he was, he and Gloria were singing and sometimes with uh, his brother, I think. Yes. And his and, sister sometimes. Uh, mm-hmm. th- they were singing in churches, you know, for that gospel concert on Sunday night. Yeah. That was, their, right. and, they, and they made a transition because there was so much demand to yes. a, an arena, which means, a venue outside of a church that's that, that kind of pushed it into a different dimension. Like, isn't that what secular artists do? Is that the idea? Exactly. And he's getting yeah. pushback. That's what you're saying. He's yep. getting he's getting some pushback, and yet the arenas were full. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he added a band, and he added you know some different things, and and I remember one concert uh, at intermission, someone put a note up on his piano bench. And it said, can you please sing The King is Coming like you did when I first heard you sing it? Which was probably Bill and Gloria and Danny, Bill's brother, just at the piano. And Bill would, Bill said, I said, Bill, what do you do with that kind of comment? He said, I know enough to know they don't want to hear it like they first heard it. It wouldn't be as good musically. Yes. They want to feel what they felt when they first heard it. And that has always just gone back in my mind that it is the people who we serve. You know, the pe- it's the people we work for. That's who we work for. We're called by God, but we work for the people. And to serve the people, that's what the Old Testament priests were called to do. Mm-hmm. Their worship was to God and God alone, to take care of the worship space 
and to serve the people. And that's got to be the mindset, not the other way around, that an audience is not there to serve us. We are there to serve them. Well, and that just leads me to <clears throat> some questions I've never asked you, but I, now, now I got gotcha. you. So <laughs> you, you had a phase of your career where you were a solo artist. I mean, I, I get the whole Bill and Gloria Gaither thing, and you toured with them, and that's mm -hmm. a whole journey, a wonderful chapter, of course. But then you were launched out into your own solo career, and you would sell out arenas. You could have 20,000 people who bought a ticket to hear Sandy Patty sing. Now, you can... I, I'm just trying to imagine the feeling of walking out into a crowd like that. And maybe it's, for me, it's not so dissimilar as walking out into a smaller crowd, still a big one, at Christmas in Washington, or where you have to perform in front of... You perform, maybe that's a not the right term, but you're presenting in a, in a venue where there are very important or powerful people as the world measures them and so on. I mean, the, these are intimidating moments. I, I just watched a Seahawks game uh, with my <gasps> wife, which, you know, it's a trip. I could go on, you know, my wife, uh, she's very emotionally engaged in <laughs> watching on TV. I tend to be more passive, but I, I think about Russell Wilson walking out. I mean, you, you walk out onto the field and the pressure of delivery and how do I how do I throw this ball just right or hold onto it and run the game myself? I mean, all of those that pressure. I just think, how do people do that? And Sandy, you've had an equivalent experience walking out onto a stage, and and just I think what you are hinting at. I, maybe I'm reading between the lines, but there are some people who walk out on that stage and they think it's about them. Mm, mm. And I'm hearing you say, no, you you had a different framing. But tell me about that. When you first started doing that, or maybe it's still a thing for you when you have to walk out in front of a crowd, how do you experience that? What are you thinking? What? How do you get into the zone where you can yeah. say, you know what? I'm, <laughs> they're going to feel something here. They're not mm -hmm. just going to celebrate a piece of art. Well, I think a quick answer to that, and then of course you know I will have a longer answer. But the quick answer to that, the lyrics tell the truth. And on any given night, whether I feel it or, you know, inspiration or aspiration, whether, whether I aspire for it to be true or I'm inspired because I know it to be true, it's still true. Mm -hmm. There is strength in the name of the Lord. There is power. So for me, there's, there's always a little bit less pressure because I feel like what I'm saying is true. Now, now you take the whole other side of it. And um, that's where preparation, practice, pra passion, prayer, and planning come in. And some people, you know, I, I kind of have that in a little circle. Because some people jump in with a, an enormous amount of passion but they haven't prepared and they haven't practiced. And so it, it almost is like, it doesn't matter where you jump in on that cycle, but somewhere along the way, all of those have to continue to be, you know, used and cycled. So practicing, you, you, you perform what you practice. That's a sports analogy. That's a mm. singer analogy. Mm. That's, that is. And so being prepared, is really key. If you are nervous to take a math test that you have not studied for, then you should be nervous. If you are nervous to take a math test that you have studied for, that's a different nervousness. My mom always said, if you stop getting nervous, then you stop caring about what you do. And so those nerves, it, they are always there. There's this moment that I refer to it as the third stage of labor. The third stage of labor is that moment when a woman's giving birth and she's like, you know what? I'm just going to come back tomorrow and finish that. Is that okay with everybody? Like there's not even a choice, yeah. but you just feel that in that moment. There's that panic of, I cannot do this but then you do. And the more times you go through that exercise, it doesn't mean that nerves are less. You just know that God is more faithful. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So, um, 
And I, do you remember the movie Hoosiers? Yes. Um, and this little town in Indiana, they were going to the state basketball champs. Which is a big deal. It's a in thing Indiana. in Indiana. That's I right. mean, it's a huge deal. And they had been practicing in their gym um, and been winning all their games. And then they went to the big arena downtown. And the first thing the coach did was remind them of the basics. He measured the court, he measured how far from the free throw to the net. He's like, guys, nothing has changed about our game. It's just that more people are listening. And I think that is such a great analogy. Um, you know, yeah, it, when there's more people, somehow it feels like there's a little bit more at stake. But still, if you plan, practice, prepare, passion, and, and I forget the fifth one now off the top of my head. But, you know, you go in taking a math test prepared, but you're still going to be a little bit nervous. And so, do you have a memory of something, you did all that, and it wasn't according to plan? <laughs> you know, <laughs> something happens that you, you have to think on your feet or you have to respond. Because mm -hmm. part of the intimidation is, you know, I take a math test, and the questions are on a piece of paper or they're online, and they're not going to change up. But when you yeah. walk out to a live event, right? I mean, there are all some wild cards. Help me, have you had moments like that in... And is that also scary, thinking, what's going, what could happen here? Yeah. So my dad was a minister of music. You know that. And um, I remember one Sunday, we were at our church in San Diego, and the church office was literally just right off of the stage. And so everybody was singing, and it was maybe in between. And the phone rang, which was kind of unusual on a Sunday morning, but the phone rang. And my dad made some funny little comment. I don't even know what he said at the time. But so I asked him about that on the way home. And he said, you know, when something unusual happens, everybody knows it. So if you're on the platform and you're kind of in charge, just draw attention to it. It's okay. Acknowledge it's it. It's like not a big deal because it's not like people aren't noticing it. Um, so I feel, you know, there have been times people's cell phones have gone off or um, there's been a bomb scare and you've had to evacuate the building or, you know, you just kind of go, you just kind of go with it. And knowing in that moment, everyone is kind of looking to see my reaction. They're going to take because their Because in that moment, that's right. They're going to take their cue from me. And so, you know, I've gone from anywhere of, uh, oh, answer, go ahead and answer it and give me that phone. <laughs> or, you know, uh, as long as you sense that you're not going to embarrass that person and all right. that. But you just kind of, you just, uh, you just acknowledge it. And that puts everybody else at ease. And the other thing that I have really tried very hard never, ever, ever to do is blame it on my production people in that moment. Because mm -hmm. they are more worried about it than me. Even if it was their fault. <laughs> Even if it was their fault, right. that's not going to serve me right. well right. as their leader. Now, we can talk about it later, but I'm not going to embarrass them in that moment when they're already doing everything they, they know to do. So, Okay, so I, I cannot remember. I can't place this. I should have documented it in a file somewhere so I could prove that I know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> at some point in my life, I was talking to some people who were describing a recording session you had in L.A. And apparently it was a studio oh. in which Barbara Streisand also recorded. Mm -hmm. And the studio crew reported, after you had done your recording there, that they said, you know, this is where Barbara Streisand records. And, mm -hmm. and you replied to me, oh, wow, well, wow. I mean, she's, she's <laughs> top of the line. She's nobody better than Barbara. I'm a fan. And they said, well, we always believed she was the best in the world, but now we know you are. And I think they were reflecting on just exactly what you described there, a little bit about your soul for music, your commitment to it, mm -hmm. the excellence. And of course, what we just have to acknowledge is a gift that you've had for song and still have. Now, I, I'm, I'm using that as a segue because you used to do a thing, I've seen you do it, where you kind of <laughs> mimic Barbara Streisand, you mimic Car Karen mm -hmm. Carpenter. You know, these were great uh, <laughs> female vocalists that you can... 
you can replicate their style singing Jesus Loves Me or, you know, where you close your eyes and you're thinking Barbara Streisand singing that. And I'm guessing she doesn't really sing that. <laughs> Probably not that particular one. <laughs> anyway, but so uh, as you look around the world and, you know, you've referenced your parents reverentially and so you should, uh, obviously they have poured a lot of knowledge and wisdom into you and, and, and appreciation and skill for music. But if you look at the big world... Mm-hmm. Name two that you're you, just musicians out there. You think these people have got this. I think uh, they are worth studying. Up currently, like right anywhere, now, anywhere in your but, life. Well, uh, definite. I I have long been a fan of Natalie Grant. Um, I think she she has a way of singing far beyond the song. Um, she has a way of telling the story of a lyric. And her voice is just, it's just absolutely phenomenal. Oh, and uh, what, what's her home place? Where does she live? Oh, let's oh, see, Jim. Oh, 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 Seattle. Oh, Seattle. I, I got some roots there. Sorry. <laughs> oh, Good you call. know, and Good she's call. a massive Seahawks fan. <laughs> yeah, okay. But, but I do think she is, as far as a vocalist, just absolutely wonderful. I love Michael Buble, and I've gotten to see him once live, and he is there for the people. Like you have no doubt that when you're sitting in the audience that he is like so happy you're there. He's so honored you're there. He is going to ha- make sure if it's up to him, you have the best time you have ever had. That's how it felt to you. That's how I mean, it, it felt to me. I mean, me. it works because yeah. you got that. <laughs> exactly. And, I'm, and so I do love him very much. And I have to say, I adore our Indianapolis Symphony so much. And it just killed me that we did not get to do Yuletide this year. But I, you know, God willing and all of that, I'll be doing it this coming 2021. Awesome. So, so Sandy's referring to the Christmas holiday pageant called Yuletide. It's uh, right in downtown Indianapolis in their Symphony Hall. And it, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a classic, it's traditional, it's part Broadway, it's part heartstrings, it's part just like fun, it's all of that. And yeah. they, they, the symphony, Yuletide, brings in a host. And Sandy, you've done that role several times. And you're telling me this year, 2021 Christmas, you're on the docket. On the docket. I'm in. And I'm I, in. I can't <laughs> wait. It is, you know, and, and it's so unique because everything you hear from that stage is live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's nothing if supplemented. You hear, if, you, if you hear singing that and you don't see singers on the stage, they're singing live off stage. I mean, it's just. Nobody, phenomenal. I've been to it several times. I'll just say, I, I go every year that you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure it's good other years too. But nobody can go to that. No one can go to that and not feel more filled with life and hope at the end than they were at the yeah. beginning. And I'm honestly, that's an experience worth the pain for. It is. And what I love about the Indianapolis people and the producers is from the moment you park your car, it's an experience. There's reindeer out front and there's you know, there's people in the lobby and there's cookies and and then people have already made up their mind how they feel about the show by their experience going Before on. they even get there. Yeah. And I think churches could take a very big lesson. There's from something that. there. Yep. We have this lady in our church that she's a she's a part helps park cars. And she has flags and she has pom poms. <laughs> and you know, she is welcoming people. And they have already made up their mind about how they feel about the church by how they've been welcomed before they even walk in the door. It's so critical. Uh, they're not having to plow through some negative experience in the church meeting because of what yeah. happened out front. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Exactly. And some of that goes on. All right. So, you know, we've <laughs> talked a little bit about music here and, and, before I, I want to talk about Sandy's voice that's not music, but before I go <laughs> there, um, the music industry has changed so much in your professional career. I mean, think about it. Uh, you, you have sold millions of records and discs, and you, know, you have platinum records. That, that means, <laughs> records are coming back now. Well, so. I, I, I tell you, got, <laughs> my son Nathaniel has got a turntable, and all he wants are LPs. But, well, listen, I have a... Warehouse full. <laughs> I need to connect you to him. You know, he's a fan, so I'll tell him that. 
but you know, you have you've sold uh, five times. You've sold platinum records, but, but uh, millions of copies of records and gold records. There's five hundred thousand sales, and then of course there's the whole award systems of Grammys, five Grammys, which is the recognition of your peers in the music industry of excellence top of the line. There are Dove Awards, which is the gospel music industry's kind of Oscar, Grammy, uh, combined 40 of those. I mean, there's so many ways in which you have demonstrated excellence and, shall we say, appeal to the vast public through your professional career. But record records is almost an antiquated term. Of course, it's coming okay. back in vogue, but the whole idea of downloading music and there's not, you know, I've I've got a CD player that I dust off, but really I should be just using my Spotify list with the remote speakers I have in my house. I mean, right. all of the, there's right. so many things that have redefined it. Yeah. And when you started out, I mean, you were in a world where you went to a record company, everybody produced a yeah. record, it went, you went to the store to buy it and so on, and now it's not like that at all. I mean, how, do, what do you think? Uh, are you apprehensive about how it's developed or do you think it's a vast new opportunity What's your your view on the evolution of the music industry? Yeah, I I think it's it has been very very interesting, and when the music sharing stuff started happening, um, that became you know, music. We love we love music. Artists love music, but it is also our profession. And we've been privileged to, you know, be able to make a living at something that we love so much. But Napster really came came on the scene. That was a, a music sharing thing. And when music began to be able to share that freely, it dramatically hurt um, record companies, um, songwriters, artists, um, in terms of financially. And that's not the only reason people do what we do, but it is a piece of it. Um, and so that, that very much hurt. Um, there were some things changed and people are able to track that still, but once music got online, um, it's more accessible. So people are maybe listening to you and mm -hmm. finding mm -hmm. you easier. But as far as, I mean, that's, I think one of the reasons that many record companies have gone out of business um, because there's just not that um, anchor of knowing, you know, it, it, it's it's just, it's made it a lot more difficult. Now, those who have been songwriters, and I wish somebody had told me this a long time ago, songwriting will always have a, an anchor, whether it's, you know, uh, financially or whether it's just longevity being a songwriter is really um, where people are making their mark. Because people can write music, and no matter what the delivery system, they can still yeah. own that music. That's what you're saying. Yes, that's yes. correct. Um, so I always joke and say, yeah, songwriters rent jets. Artists rent RVs. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how the, that's to what the world has become. Yeah. So, you know, as far as the actual music industry, Christian music industry, it's very hard to, so many have been assimilated into, you know, a record company here and there, and it's, it's, uh, it's just made it tough. And I also think that there are a lot more artists out there, which is a wonderful thing. And so I think Gaither's generation and my generation, you know, just maybe gave voice to other people that, um, hey, you know what? This feels this feels like what God's gifted me with, and I can do that. So that that is good. But it is a it is a very tough season right now for record companies per se. The music is still getting out there, and that's awesome. Well, just as a kind of sidebar, my recollection is you had a very smart attorney way back when who helped you own your music in a way that artists at the time did not. You know, you might, you sign up with a record company, you record, they produce an album, but you don't actually own it. It's a little bit like a television series. You don't really have a right to its replication and its use going forward in the future, but that, that you had a guy who helped you essentially put in a vault some of the iconic 
uh, recordings. I mean, is that, am I reading that right? And so I'm not going to be able to find you just out in the public domain because you have a, a collection that is yours. Is that fair? Some of the things I've been able to maintain ownership of the intellectual and musical yes. property. Some of the things, you know, I have not, but I'm thankful that um, we're able to have some of that. And, and that's one of the things I would absolutely advise a new artist is, you know, make, I think that's, that becomes really critical. You have to think through before yeah. you release, you have to think through ownership because if you don't yeah. think it through at the front end, you can't ever call it back. Nope. You can't. Yeah. Yep. You just can't, yeah. And and so I could I could find another artist sing the Star Spangled Banner. I, I'm not sure that's one of your pieces that you own, but I'm just saying I, there are mm -hmm. things that I associate with your voice that I might find someone else who can in this wild west of uh, online access they can do those songs. But I, an artist can still have some control of what they produce. Yes. And and now what's what what makes it very interesting, and this is why I was talking about songwriting. Um, for instance, there's a lovely gal, Mar Mary Milburn, who sang the Star Spangled Banner at the Republican National Convention. She, I, people started texting me and saying, you really need to hear her sing. So I looked her up. The thing is, um, because I didn't write that or arrange it or own the copyright, she didn't have to get my permission. Because she's doing the arrangement that you sang. Yes. I gotcha. Yep. And she did a phenomenal she job. She nailed it. Phenomenal job. So if you're an artist, you don't have to, somebody doesn't have to get your personal permission. What they do have to get is if it's going to be televised and oh, there's just so many rules now. Um, it's really about the copyright and the songwriter, but yep. anyone's welcome to sing my songs if they can find the tracks. And Right. But if I want to hear you sing it, I may have to go through a process where you still have some leverage over the yeah. control. The and, you know, we have, and I don't mean to make this a commercial, but I think it, it's it's worth saying, I have a YouTube channel now. So uh, listeners can go on there and we post a lot of oldies and a lot of new things. And there's just some great content on that YouTube channel. There's also a fun little show. I don't know if you've seen this, that Don and I do on Saturday nights. And it's called Sunsets with Dan and Cindy because those are our pre-tiree names. Um, got all of this from the Almanac. And so we do something practical, inspirational, and educational in these episodes. And it's Saturday night on Facebook. So there's all kinds of content on, on social media, but especially on Sandy Patty Facebook. So go to Sandy Patty on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And you can access a, a kind of Facebook Live on Saturday mm -hmm. nights. On Saturday and night. That, and it's sunset with Dan and Cindy. Dan and Cindy, because according to the Almanac, we are the largest generation, the boomer generation. Yes. They call us the silver tsunami. Mm -hmm. And so we are retirement age, but we don't want to really retire. So they call us pre-tirees. Okay. So I just felt like we needed some pre-tiree names. And so that's where Dan and Cindy came from. So I challenge you and Maureen <laughs> to come up with your pre-tiree names. Well, you know, she calls and me. let us know. She calls me Thor. So how do you think that's going to work? <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Well, maybe we'll, we'll let that slide, but <laughs> I'm with you. Edit. <laughs> I'm with you. Saturday nights, Facebook Live, Sunsets with Dan and Cindy at the Sandy mm -hmm. Patty page. Awesome. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's we've, so fun. We've spent a long time here, Sandy, talking about music and your voice. You know, in 1988, a guy wrote a book. I'm, I'm not telling you what you don't know, but for our audience, wrote a book <laughs> saying, Sandy Patty, the voice of gospel. And it, it, it kind of, <laughs> it stuck as a, you were the voice because your, your vocal capacity, your capacity, your, your range, and, and the power voice you have. But I, I just have to say, Sandy, one of your great gifts has been not just to be a power voice, because there are other power voices, but you have the capacity to be when I say a power voice, someone who can project with real power, but also to bring that right down close and personal and the most mm. intimate way that just pulls us in the combination of your lyric commitment and the music 
strain of your language, so to speak. So good. But you are not your voice. In other words, the, the singing voice of Sandy Patty is not the sum of who you are. And, then, you know, I have, a, I have another, uh, another. There's Sandy Patty and there's Barbara Streisand. I'm fans. Karen Carpenter, I'm in. Uh, another great voice vocalist that has just, you know, you got to see me as a little... 12 year old guy uh, watching the sound of music, but I was just dazzled oh. by Julie Andrews. I mean, I just thought this woman, she was it's just like everything, everything. She just, the whole presentation of herself was just yeah. made me crazy. Yeah. And, and of course we all know Julie Andrews had four octave range and, mm-hmm. you know, from a childhood star singing for the queen and all that. And, and then in the late nineties, she gets a, a little cyst that is described mm-hmm. as, benign and not mm-hmm. consequential. She's in between production of a Broadway show. They, they've taken a few weeks off. Uh, the stories I've read are that, you know, her husband and the production staff said, you know, why don't you just get that taken care of while you're uh, off? And she has a surgery which removes her capacity to sing. I, there, yeah. I'm, I'm saying, I, I've... I've read and heard you say that, you know, even as a child, you weren't so secure, but you could see Julie Andrews singing that song, I've Got Confidence in the Sound yes. of Music, you know, and you could kind of hum that along. And, mm-hmm. and, you, and I'm just, I'm th- I, this came to mind as I'm thinking about you because for Julie Andrews, uh, you know, so far she hasn't agreed to be on the podcast, maybe someday, <laughs> but, maybe someday. but, but uh, mm-hmm. after she sees you here, I know she's in, but <laughs> I, I'm guessing she went through a profound like drama in her own sense of self where she mm-hmm. had a marker that so defined her and suddenly it's yeah. gone. Of course, yeah. she's, she's created a career without music. But, yes, she uh, has. Have you heard of Bridgerton? But, uh, exactly. <laughs> but let's go back to Sandy. What happens to Sandy when her voice isn't there? Or I, I know you've already kind of wrestled with this, that mm-hmm. you are not your voice. You're not your, just your music. No. There's so much more there. It's, it's funny because um, when the record company felt like mm, so many years ago, they needed to sort of brand whatever they were calling me. And so they came up with the voice. And I just remember then thinking, man, if they only knew how much I don't feel like I have a voice to speak up. Um, it's just like you're saying far beyond music. I, I didn't know how to speak up for myself. I didn't know how to speak up in my marriage. I didn't know how to speak up with people that I worked with. Um, And I longed to find my voice just to be able to say normal things like a lot of people do, but I tried to so hard to say what I thought somebody wanted me to hear that I lost knowing what defined me. And it wasn't until God really began to just do a work in my heart. First, I started Bible study fellowship, and then I started doing counseling and just began to find, change my identity, who who am I in Christ, that I began to feel like I could speak up about some things. And um, so that always just struck me as such an irony that they'd call me the voice when it's like, you have no idea. And so I feel like maybe 30 years ago, there are a lot more people listening to what I have to say, but I honestly didn't feel like I had anything to say. And now I feel like a lot less people are listening to what I have to say, but I feel like I finally have something to say. And so wherever I can, I use that voice. Am I hearing you say, Sandy, that you went through a period of life, both as a child and adolescent and as a woman, where you, you, you did not actually process what you thought. You, 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 were, mm-hmm. you were preoccupied with reflecting what you thought was expected. And so that yep. you, you had a voice in the sense that you articulated words and ideas, but they were not original to you in the way that you find now, that you, you were simply yep. a mirror. You were trying to be a mirror to please. Yeah, yeah those yep. who are watching. Uh, yep. and, and then you've gone through a, a journey which has uh, caused you to wrestle with that. And I'm hearing you say that today, you feel like, no, I speak for myself. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, not just, I'm not talking to you, Jim, 
to tell you what I think you want to hear on this podcast. I'm actually articulating yeah. ideas that are original or held by me. Fair? Yep. Fair. Okay. But, Absolutely. But you still were choosing lyrics, for instance. So this is back to why music may be in a bridge. You know the story of, of Carly Simon? You know, this is a, a woman who had, you know, born into wealth and prominence. Her uh, family was like Simon and Schuster, the publisher. And, and yet she had a stuttering problem and she could hardly mm. communicate. And then she learned she could sing without stuttering. And Carly That's Simon so then, you know, began to sing as a way of expression. I mean, would you say your music was a little bit of that for you? That even in a world where you didn't so have voice, much. you're just, well, I could go with this lyric because I, I get that. Yeah, I get that. And I can tell that story. I, I used to say I would hide behind a song. And now I feel like I can come alongside a song and tell it. But, but, but music became my voice when you know, I didn't know how to say no one ever cared for me like Jesus, even when my best friend at school, you know, just decided without me knowing she wasn't going to talk to me. Well, I could find a lyric, you know, from something that we sang at church or I've got confidence from Sound of Music or whatever. And really, it just, it, that became my voice. And now you don't have to sing to speak. Mm -mm. I like to. Uh, I like to sing. Music will always be a part of my everyday life. When it, during the pandemic, I would sing. I would get the hymnal and I would sing hymns one through 10. And then the next day I'd sing hymns <laughs> 11 through 20. And then I just kept singing through, through the hymnal. And then I'd start over wow. um, because, you know, I really didn't have words about a year ago at this time. And some of those songs just helped me voice, put voice to the story of my heart. Well, I, I just, I have to ask, now is that the 1953 <laughs> you, you Church, that. Church of yeah. God hymnal with the nope. maroon cover? Nope. Oh, you've is got... The, is the, the Gaither hymnal. Oh, Whatever well, okay. It's, it's a good wannabe, but come yeah, on. I know. <laughs> Hymn number 25 from the red hymnal. Uh... Number 25, you're stumping me. I know 16. Child of God. No, it's 260, no. Oh, 262. No, so. 262. Right. Yeah. So it's uh, What a Mighty God We Serve, I think. Is that's it. No, you got it. You're, you're right. Okay. That's it. There yeah. you go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's a side show that most people could not appreciate, but you I and I totally really get it. I really love that show. <laughs> but, but the power of those lyrics can carry yes. you through. But you are, And you know, like most songs written now, those stories behind many of those hymns we're yeah. born out of brokenness. Yes. And uh, or somebody saying, I don't have words for what's going on in my heart right now. But anyway, so music is powerful. All that to say, <laughs> music is powerful. It is. Uh, <laughs> but now that you don't have to sing to speak, so to speak, in other words, you're feeling more secure in projecting ideas, sharing ideas, mm -hmm. even as you listen. What do you want to say? Well, I mean, what do you want to say to an audience that is walking through a pandemic and a world turned upside down politically and, you know, the economy is, is stretched to a snapping point. I mean, mm -hmm. what would you say to a world like that without a song? I think the first thing I would say is, and this is something that people begin to offer me early on in my speaking my voice, is everything you're feeling is so valid. It's just, it's a hard, it's been a hard, hard season. And there, it's been a season with very few answers and a whole lot of, um, I, you know, we've used pivot to where we can't use it anymore, but we've pivoted to, to where we've pirouetted. Now we're just doing pirouettes and <laughs> I'm so dizzy from doing pirouettes. I can't even stand straight, but there are some constants and the constant for me this year has been going back to the basics. And for me, that has been God's word. I, I wish I had, I could pull this up right now. I don't know where it is in the Psalms, but it says he notices, he notices our pain. Like just coming across scriptures like that this year for me, have been wonderful. One thing I would say to those who are believers 
is there's a reason the Psalms, uh, again, they're songs, but to, to take those Psalms and read them out loud, when we don't have words to say, go ahead and read the Psalms because all the feelings are in there. And I would say the government is, I don't mean to sound trite with this at all, but the government will be on his shoulders. And we may not understand, but I have found I've gone back to the basics of the things that I know, that I know, that I know. And that I know where I've come from and I know where I'm going and I can rest in that. And that is my security. Well, just like Jesus in John chapter 13. Mm-hmm. He knew where he came exactly. from and knew where he was going. And, exactly. and that sense of self-awareness allowed him to humble himself. And I guess I would say one last practical thing is offer the dignity of disagreement with someone. Invite it. Um. That's easier to do when we know where we've come from and we know where we're going. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to speak someone's language if we don't understand it and if we don't have uh, the context for it. And it just might surprise you to offer someone the dignity of disagreement. I know that uh, you have a real heart for Christian counseling. You've already referred to Mm -hmm. in this conversation how powerful you think it is can be and how it's helped you. But I yeah. think also deep down inside Sandy Patty, she she would have loved to have been not on the stage with 20,000 people some moments as she would have loved to just be that person who helped someone else navigate. You know, And a lot of therapy and counseling is actually listening. Mm-hmm. I mean, tell me about that. How, how do you listen? What do, what do you say to us to listen better, even to the dignity of disagreement? But I mean, how do yeah. I listen? I think one of the best ways to listen is ask questions. Um, oh, and if you don't even know, oh, hmm, tell me more about that. Uh, well, that, that is interesting. Can you unpack that a little bit for me? Um, that, that keeps you less defensive. Um, it also maybe sparks something in the person talking that they might not have thought about a, an angle because they're they're going to offer you sound bites at first mm-hmm. and then you say well hmm, hey can you tell me more about that then they might look over their shoulder and go you really want to hear what i think <laughs> and yeah i really do and and if they don't ask you questions back fine that's not why you're there but the one of the best ways to listen is to ask questions you know, I love the passage at the end of Luke's gospel, the road to Emmaus, and if you recall that, mm. Jesus is walking with two of his disciples who don't recognize him, and they're yes. quite disturbed. There's a lot of anxiety in the conversation. It's the, the first Easter day. They're quite confused. They're upset, and Jesus comes alongside, and, and that's exactly what he does. He, yeah. he simply says, well, you're, you're kind of upset. What's going on? And then they start saying, well, you're the only person who hasn't heard about this guy. Just, you know, and, <laughs> and they go on and describe the whole narrative and how we thought he was going to be the Messiah, but now he was you know, murdered or killed. And now you know, yeah, they say these... Yeah. I mean, he's doing the whole thing. Jesus has already got this, but yeah. he's, he's walking those miles. He's actually done just have it. He's the answer exactly. To the- their questions, well, he's, but he's allowing them. It's yeah. a long form conversation on the road yes, to Emmaus, isn't it? Love that. And it's not until they finally unpack all that they yeah. have got in their hearts yeah. that he yeah. begins to say, "Well, have you thought about it this way?" Yeah. Well, there you go. That's and, good. I like that. I mean, that's that's, that's where I'm hearing that's you. That's a talk. nice take on that. Now you know something about listening because you and Don have raised eight children together. Mm-hmm. It's a that's a houseful. That is a house full. And now we have six in-laws, eight grandkids, and it is, and it is a lot. It's, it's a circus at times, and circus can be fun, Ooh. but also, you know, it's a journey. And so get, just give me something out of, yours was a blended family. And, and mm-hmm. you know, what, what are some of the lessons? You've got to learn something about listening. What do you do with your kids when they, they show up and say, what? 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, how do you respond to that? Or, or what's a lesson of bringing people together who maybe didn't start in the same place? What would you say? I know, and that is, um, Don and I have gotten the opportunity the last couple of years to really talk specifically to blended families. There just were not a lot of resources out for us when we were blending, which was 25 years ago. You know, we celebrated our 25th Oh, my this goodness. Year. Wow. 25. Um, but I think the first thing, and this is a hard reality, but it's true. Every blended family is born out of loss. I mean, it's just, it's not good. It's not bad. It just is. Um, and you really kind of have to start there. Um, and the only ones who chose this family were the two of you. So you really have to make sure that that is solid. The other thing is that we've, we learned the hard way is that a step parent is more like a beloved teacher. There are things that I can say to my biological kids that I would smack Don silly if he said them that way to my kids mm -hmm. or a teacher that you love or a coach. Mm -hmm. There's just, it, it just is. And so rather than try to create this perfect family, which already isn't because of the way it was born, find out what role works best. And we have found like an advocate works best as a step parent and um, let the other parent be the heavy and then the step parent kind of be the encourager, you know, and then and vice versa. But we've always tried to listen to the uniqueness of our kids and not try to put them all in one. Now that was hard because someone to go to one high school and someone to go to the other. So we had two high schools happening. So that was not fun for us, but it served them. It honored them. It respected it, the dignity of yes. their difference. <laughs> uh, yeah. And um, it's just, it's a unique, it's a unique um, system, a blended family system. You wrote a book about it called Life in the Blender. Life on the in screen the right now. Thanks, Ryan, for pulling yep. that up. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it is a, it's a challenge, and it yet is. here you have these kids, and they're standing up straight and finding their way. And they are finding their way, and they're good. They are good kids, and we were so grateful we had a village. And we had the Park Place family village. We had the North Anderson family village, um, our churches that really spoke into our kids in that season. And we are so grateful for that. Don't be afraid to use your village. I mean, <laughs> you're going to need them. <laughs> oh, I get that. And, you know, th those people are in your house. You're, you're up close and personal. That's your family. And that kind of brings us back to where we started. You, you have walked on a stage where you have intersected with all kinds of people. And one of my earliest memories, uh, Sandy, of meeting you way back in the early 90s, was it seemed to me you had your foot in a cast because you you had uh, broken your ankle or your foot or something playing volleyball with Colin Powell at Camp David. I mean, yes. If I got that right, I mean, that's, I mean, that's if way you're back. gonna break your foot, you might as <laughs> okay. well get a great story out I mean, of it. Well, well. So what's the context? How do you get to? How do I get to the volleyball <laughs> court David. at Camp David? How does that work? How do we get to Camp David? Well. Um, President Bush. Um, this is and, first President Bush. Yes. And Barbara became sweet friends and supporters. And um, so they had built a brand new chapel at Camp David and asked if I would come and help be part of that dedication. And I got to kind of put a little program together. And um, it was just so, so sweet. And so we were there the whole weekend. And they said, you know, well, we're going to go over to, you know, the gym and we're going to play volleyball, which is like volleyball in a racquetball court. And they they just clearly did not know that I don't play games for fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take it very seriously. I'm sorry if you're the president, but I'm going to spike the heck out of you. <laughs> and so I did. I went up to the future. I blocked the, the George H.W. Bush. No, George W. Bush. Which, who am I talking about? Well, you're talking, the dad, H.W., the president. Well, and then the future president. W. was there. Yeah, yep. he was there. I blocked him. 
I like went up and blocked him and came down on my ankle. Um, and so the, you know, the presidential doctor, you know, came and took a look at it and it's like, yeah, I think you've broken it. We'll, we'll wrap it, but you probably want to see your doctor when you go home. And all I'm thinking there is, oh my gosh, this is such a great story. <laughs> 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 but they were just so generous and so kind. And uh, my parents got to go with me that weekend. And my mother just will always remember sitting by the pool, visiting with Barbara Bush. I mean, that just, yeah. that was really sweet. <clears throat> well, I mean, you you performed live in front of five presidents, I think. I mm -hmm. mean, five. Uh, uh, a, that's a lot of intersections. And of course, there are other people of prominence. I mean, and Democrat and, and Republican. Republican. That's right. So. Both sides of the aisle. Yep. Uh, music Once works. Once they're in office, it's our job to pray for them. And and music works for everyone, doesn't it? Yeah, music I mean, is a great bridge, like leveler in a bridge. Yes, yep. indeed. But so, I mean, thinking about those intersections, are there any qualities or characteristics that stand out that you would say, you know, I learned mm -hmm. from from them or this experience that this is the way to be. I will never forget Mrs. Bush's hospitality. And you're talking about Barbara, Barbara Bush? Bush's, mm -hmm. Barbara's, uh, Barbara Bush's hospitality. Um, one time I got to go up into the residence of the White House. And when you walk off the, you know, you, you, the elevator opens and you're like right there. And the, there it is. And she's showing us, you know, all around. And um, she was so sweet and just so genuine and so down to earth. And... Um, you know, I just always thought she just looked so elegant and with great, she's so dignified. And I said, oh, Mrs. Bush, you just look beautiful. I said, you look great. She says, I am great. <laughs> and it wasn't like, a, yeah, yeah. it was just, I, I know who I am. And yes. I will never forget that because that's, that is how she presented herself in a very humble way. But she knew who she was. Well, in a way, you could um, say, that's a woman who had her own voice. Absolutely. And I just remember her without hesitation saying, you know what? I am great. <laughs> and I, that, I mean, that just sticks in my mind. I love that. And then, of course, she was like, well, here's, here's, well, this is just the president's bathroom, you know, because, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know. He might have to take a call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was it was just I just remember her hospitality um, was so so gracious, so kind and gracious. You know that I don't know if you remember at Saturday Night Live there used to be a character that <clears throat> made me howl. Who no matter what a, no matter what a person said, whatever their story was. This character had a better story, you know. If, if oh yeah, if, oh yeah. So, if so her, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If her yeah. cat run got run over, yeah. well, I had five cats that got run over. Right, yeah. right, <laughs> but right. But I, so, I'm just calling out my own self awareness. But I have to tell you a Barbara Bush story. You're, because, you're getting ready to play. Can you talk this? <laughs> that's that's you? right. Well, no, but I, I want to affirm you. But you know, there was a day way back when when I had a political game going in Seattle, my home, and I I was in the legislature and it's a mm -hmm. small time, but. I had a good friend, her name was Della Newman, who was a friend of H.W. and Barbara Bush. And mm -hmm. um, anyway, when President Bush came to Seattle, he was a kind of guy, I was told by my friend Della, that he was very old school and that he believed if there was to be a public dinner, some pastor, a clergyman had to pray. I mean, that, that was just his thing. He didn't do a dinner unless there was a clergyman because he grew up in a kind of, uh, in an mm -hmm. Episcopal home where that was important anyway. He called Della, said, do you know somebody that can pray at my dinner? And she called me. So Marina and I went to this dinner at the Western Hotel, the Grand Ballroom and all this stuff where George Bush is going to speak. And before that, because you're going to, I had, he, the clergyman in his protocol sat at his right arm. I mean, that's just the way it was. So all the dignitaries are on the table, but I'm the pastor, so I get there. So in order to be seated at the table, you have to go to a, a pre-reception uh, where they had the high-end donors. You know, literally, the Boeing family, the Nordstrom family, you know, these people are at a private thing. And Maureen and I, because you have to be screened <laughs> by the circuit service. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So, of course, we're just like, we're kids, early 30s, and and Maureen is like, what am I going to wear? And so she bought the salmon-colored dress. I'll never get it. So then we're going through the receiving line, and there's Barbara Bush. She comes over to Maureen, 
Oh. And she said, oh. And we had name tags or something. She said, oh, Maureen. I mean, she just, like, we, like we'd like known her. Oh, oh Maureen, yeah. that color is so beautiful on you. And she just went on about that. And we never forgot that. Mm-hmm. And we thought, you know, she, she meets a thousand people, but she made us feel like yes. we were noticed. Okay, so. Yes. Two years went by, and the bushes came back, and Della calls me and says, he's coming back, will you pray? <laughs> <laughs> so we go through the same role, and Maureen says, I'm wearing the same dress to see if she remembers. <laughs> oh! <laughs> of course, she doesn't remember. That. She doesn't? No, well, I'm... no, but I'm just saying that she, at the same kind of experience where she, she, ma- she just had a way of making you the yes. person who walked that in off the left stage and walked out the other stage, yes. like... You are important. You, I yep. notice you. I'm, yep. I'm not. I'm not just here on my job. I'm here to yep. to meet up with you. And and so it's nothing like being at Camp David with them. But I'm I'm authenticating <laughs> from the from the peanut right? gallery. Absol- no, there there yes. was something there. And boy, if we could all do that. Yeah. Uh, so that someone like how many people do all of us meet? And no matter mm-hmm. what our station in life might be, mm-hmm. that if we made one person every day feel like they were yes. noticed. Yep. And respected. I mean, that yep. no small thing there. No small thing. All that to say, Sandy Patty. Oh. <laughs> All that to say. All that to say. Aww. So proud to know you. So Likewise. thankful that you're in my life. You know, in uh, back to Seattle days, and, and the story for our audience is I lived in Seattle, and I, and I was called to Anderson to become a pastor where Sandy then lived. And I remember... Uh, Going to the Billy Graham crusade, there was a Billy Graham crusade in Seattle in 1990 in the Kingdom, and I was asked to be on the executive committee as a local clergyman, and I was, and I sat on the platform. And in this Billy Graham crusade, which actually set a record for the old Kingdom, now replaced by Lumen Field, where the Seahawks play, but uh, I, I think there were like 76,000 people jammed in, mm-hmm. and you came with Larnell Harris and sang, mm-hmm. I believe you sang, I've just seen Jesus. In any case, I was... I was on the platform watching that from behind, and it was so jaw-dropping. And <laughs> it was just at that time, though, it was April 1990, and I was wrestling with whether or not to move to Anderson. <gasps> and it's called. Nobody no knew way. that, but in my mind, wow. I knew. Anyway, so I went home after that, and we were talking, and my kids, my oldest son, Jacob, who you know is in the fifth grade, mm-hmm. he was not a fan of moving. He, mm-hmm. you know, he actually said, there are no, all the girls in Indiana are ugly. He's in the fifth grade, like, <laughs> 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 you know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember setting them down because they were all dazzled by the Sandy Patty moment. I said, well, guess what? If we move to Anderson, oh. maybe maybe we'll meet her. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and here, here we are all these years on. And you know what, Sandy? So glad we met you. Thanks so much. So, so glad. And thank you for how you've spoken into our lives over the years and our kids and Maureen. I just, I love that woman. She's one of the fiercest. I mean, she raised four boys and maybe oh. five along the way. <laughs> well, <laughs> and uh, we just love you both so well, very much. Same right back at you. Greetings to everyone in your house, your kids too. Thank you. And remember. I'll pass that on today. Remember, when you're walking out of here, after you get done with everything, you say, all that to say. All that to say. All right. God bless. <laughs> For more information, visit allthattosay.org. Thank you for joining the conversation. Don't forget to like and subscribe.